So it's my pleasure to introduce you guys to Sarah Hoffman, who is the CMO at Drybar. So um, really excited to have you here today. Yeah, thank thanks you for coming. Too. So from starting out as a small blowout business to growing into a extremely large um, company, Drybar is an extreme success. And so we're really excited to hear about how Drybar has really successfully grown to having over 100 stores nationwide. Mm -hmm. right? um, and you probably passed one of the 22 New York salons today just on your way to this conference. Yeah. Um, but in addition to the brick and mortar shops, you guys also have a pretty significant um, e-commerce presence too, right? They're selling um, their own specialty hair tools as well as specialty hair products um, through major beauty retailers like Sephora. Um, and so personally, as somebody who travels all the time and who has a lot of hair, Dry Bar has also changed the way that I think and how I, about hair care and how I approach hair care. So really excited to hear about Dry Bar's trajectory and so let's get started. Great. Cool. So uh, first, um, you have a really interesting resume. Um, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell us how you got here as a CMO? Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's great to be here today and excited to talk to all of you. So to kick it off, uh, as Jillian said, I'm the, currently the Chief Marketing Officer at Dry Bar. Uh, I did kind of come up the path to marketing uh, a little bit of a non-traditional way. I actually started in finance and then had the opportunity to ultimately work for uh, some amazing brands, leading brand and marketing growth across uh, Converse, Cole Haan, J. Crew, and a few others. Uh, so I have to say, you know, believe it or not, being a marketer starting with a finance background has a lot of perks. Um, particularly for me, it's really helped to inform a lot of how I think about marketing, particularly with a left brain, right brain approach. And what I mean by that is I think particularly in today's competitive retail landscape, uh, you know, you really have to have your analytics and your brand working together. It's not good enough anymore to be just good at one or the other. Uh, and for me, that really starts with that deep understanding of your customer and how you can use that and that data to help you inform everything from creative to your marketing strategies. And I'd also say, you know, leaning on my analytical beginning, that's also been really beneficial in terms of staying nimble at a brand like Drybar, you know, being very focused on testing, trying new things, always measuring, and thinking of what's gonna keep us having the most amazing experience out there. Uh, and then the other brands I would say that um, I have worked for, uh, you know, they're a true test of companies that really did have a great understanding of their data and were able to uh, maximize that and deploy that across, you know, whether it was, again, creative or merchandising or different tactics in the business. So uh, at the end of the day, I really believe if you do that and, again, lean on that finance, putting it into marketing and that analytics and brand, it's, it really is a way to transform marketing in your organizations to be you know, much more of a revenue and profit driver or than driver of shareholder value than versus, you know, in the past where it might be perceived as more of a service function. So the last thing I would say is, um, you know, it also practically speaking, having a finance background is very helpful getting credibility with your CFOs when you're always fighting for that investment. Makes so. a lot of sense. Yeah. So you talked about, you know, the former brands that you worked with, like Converse and J. Crew. Um, what excited you about joining Drive Drybar, and what are you most excited about today? Yeah, so I'll start on the personal side a bit. Uh, I have always been what we like to call a Drybar, a blowout junkie. I literally have loved giving blowouts my whole life, similar to what you were saying. Particularly when I travel, I will seek out a place to get a blowout in any city, any country that I'm in. And I fully believe, you know, in the power of you know, the happiness and confidence that you feel when you have great hair. It's as simple as that and, that, and it's truly, truly empowering. So when Dry Bar first opened in New York, uh, which is where I was previously, uh, our Flatiron store was the first location, I became an immediate fan and pretty much always used Dry Bar as that gold standard of that experience that you could get when you go to retail uh, that like was no other. 
So you can imagine when I got the call about this opportunity, it literally was a dream job. You know, iconic brand, amazing products and services, experiential retailer. She said we work with best in craft retailers. And on top of it, a very loyal customer following, which presented a huge opportunity, particularly with all of the data that we capture in our business. And then I would say the other piece is, you know, it's very exciting to be able to be part of a high growth, also female founded brand that celebrates and empowers women every day. Uh, so for me, that was really exciting too. And I would say, I'm just passing my first year mark. Uh, so spent a lot of the first year building the team, as you can imagine, establishing the strategy, putting that in place. So what I'm really psyched about you know, over the next uh, 12 months is the work we're doing to build out our customer data platform, and specifically with MParticle. It is going to really you know, propel our brand to a new level of what we're going to be able to do and inform the experience that we currently have. Awesome. We're excited to support you in that endeavor for yep. sure. Um, so let's talk about market ownership, right? So everybody that I know and their mother goes to dry bar, every time I walk into a dry bar, you're uh, servicing women of all demographics. So you know, unlike many brands that are focusing on millennials and Generation Z, how do you really run the gamut in terms of catering to baby boomers as well as Gen X and beyond? Yeah, so I'd say there's really three big things. Again, we like to call the dry bar secret sauce that makes us like no other brand. And for those of you who are familiar with the brand, you might be guessing, was well, it because they name all their services and products after cocktails? It's not a reason, but also another cool thing that we do. Uh, but you know, really the first is, I would say, we have a very clearly defined position in the market. You know, we do one thing and we do it great, which is creating the perfect blowout. We literally created that category and we work very hard to deliver an amazing blowout experience and we've been doing it for over nine years now. The second piece, which you touched on is, you know, we cater to all ages, all women, all hair types, you know, basically at every part of their life. That can be from coming in for a big meeting, you know, going out, a wedding. Uh, literally, if you are seven or 70 years old, you can come to Dry Bar and have an amazing experience. And we always want to be aspirational as well as accessible to women everywhere. And then I would say the third piece goes back to what I mentioned before, which is our a unique amount of data that we have about our customers. That really enables us to be strategic about all those different customer segments. You know, what are their preferences and behaviors? Where's the best place to communicate with them? Whether it's building out social programs all the way through some of our more uh, you know, human interaction touch points with our master classes that we do with our founders. And we know across all those segments really what resonates and keeps people engaged in the brand. Awesome. Well, I know there are many avenues for a customer to interact with Drybar too. Um, there you have your blowout junkies like myself who will, you know, book an appointment on their mobile app and then just go to the salon over and over again. And then you have your e-commerce purchasers who are buying your products, but they might not ever set foot in a salon. So how are you thinking about those different avenues for interaction? And are you thinking about leveraging them in totality to increase consumer LTV? Yeah. So this also goes back to, I'd say we have to start with the data and our understanding of our customers. Uh, as you mentioned, we have very specific profiles of people who shop with us online or shop with us in dry bar stores and come experience our services. And even though we have a pretty broad footprint, uh, it's really important for us to understand that because there aren't necessarily dry bars everywhere. So we want to be able to deliver um, you know, our products and services wherever you are, whether you can access a store or not. So I think one of the best or a couple examples I'll share of how we do that we recently launched a new product that some of you may be familiar with. It's called On the Rocks Charcoal Scalp Scrub. And it was part of, Jillian loves it. I love it, <laughs> nodding. 
part of a broader collection that had been very successful around us using charcoal ingredients. So in doing that, we not only launched the product, but we also created a service in our stores around it. And we were, when we were thinking about launching that, uh, we knew we had to appeal to all of our customers and how they would engage in the product. So for our e-com customers, we developed very specific video content, for example, on how customers could use the scrub at home and experience it and get the information. And then on the store side, we did some specific offers and programs, inviting in specifically our best customers to come in and try the new service um, and get them engaged in that too. Uh, and then another example is that I'll share, on the services side, we recently launched a new service called Dry Styling, which really was aimed at you know, creating that incremental visit for our core customers in between their typical blowout appointments, but also a more accessible price point for some of the younger segments you mentioned. So you know, we were able to build some awareness around that, drive our stores customers in to try it, but then again, similar to the previous example, we also know we have all these e-com customers that we wanted to engage too. So we took that idea around extending your blowout and created very specific content there, what products to use, how you can do that at home, and shared that across all of our online channels. That's awesome. And I am a huge fan of your charcoal scrub. Um, so let's talk about the partnerships that you have with these major beauty retailers, right? So your products are sold through a bunch of major retailers like Sephora, Ulta, Blue Mercury, but you also have your own e-commerce platform selling your products on site. So would you say that you're both partnering and competing with these retailers and what opportunities and challenges exist in working with them? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, you know, we have as a brand been very selective around our distribution outside of our dry bar channels. And as you noted with the retailers you mentioned, we really have partnered with the best in class beauty retailers for our brand. And I would say from my point of view, all of those retailers for us really represent distinct customer bases that we have an opportunity to access for our brand. We actually partner with them very closely on understanding the profiles of their customers, developing specific marketing programs and tactics that look very different across each of them as they do our own channels. And I see it as you know, a really a, the opportunity for us to be able to invest in these larger scale programs because obviously those retailers have a much bigger footprint than we even do today. And for us, it means reaching a broader audience on a more accelerated timeline. Yeah, that makes sense. And I love hearing you talk about your partnership with Sephora. It seems like they're a great partner to collaborate yep. with. So look forward to see what you'll be doing with them in the future. Yeah, no, they, they in particular, we've been able to innovate some really fun things in their stores, everything from our products all the way through some services that are really playing off of uh, particularly our bigger dry styling initiative I mentioned earlier, which we now have in select Sephora's around the country too. So it's really, really exciting. Got it. Um, so to that end, let's talk about scale. Mm -hmm. So you're continuing to open more locations across the country, you have these partnerships mm -hmm. with the major, major retailers. How can you continue to keep up with just the acceleration of retail today while continuing to maintain just the quality dry bar brand? Yeah, uh, well overall the, the great news for dry bar is we still have a ton of expansion opportunity in the US. Um, and you'll continue to see from us this year, we are going to be opening a significant, again, number of new stores, um, expanding within current markets as well as new markets that we're going into. And then we also have a big international opportunity that we're evaluating as well. Um, so it's a great position to be in. You know, we're one of the few retailers out there in our history that have never had to close a location. Uh, so we're really smart and strategic about what markets we go into, the locations, and making sure that uh, we can maximize that. And I would say, you know, as we think about that and how we keep up and on the front end of what's happening in retail, it's really a lot about 
you know, making sure we always have the best customer service. You know, constantly, I'd say, innovating our products and services, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, and always making sure that our experience and that, that customer experience is fresh and relevant. And we do different interesting things around that, whether it's through specific content, exclusive content we can create for our customers, um, as well as fun launches. For those of you who've been to a dry bar, you know that when you come to a dry bar, you can get an awesome blowout, but you also can have a glass of wine and watch one of your favorite movies. So we recently launched a fun new wine partnership, and so constantly bringing in different things to surprise and delight our customers. Uh, that kind of fit within our overall brand focus. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's talk about tooling. Obviously, you need the right tools and the right methodologies to do all of the things that you're talking about here. So what are the tools that are really required to help you guys uh, continue to scale? And what is your recommendation for maybe the next wave of retail disruptors that are thinking about their optimal stack? Yep. So for us, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we do have a wealth of data and information about our customers. Uh, really, the thing that is going to enable us to continue to grow and accelerate is harnessing that data into a place where we can use it in even a greater way, which is what we're working on right now. And I'm really excited about that uh, because although we've been doing a lot of that, it's been much more offline and, and within a bunch of disparate systems. So to be able to pull that together and a lot of things we heard earlier and activate against those uh, is really from a marketing standpoint going to uh, boost us up to the next level. Uh, and I would say, you know, if I think about uh, advice to other retailers or startups, uh, it would be very much on those same lines. It's like, do what you can to harness your customer data as soon as you can. And you may not have the investment to put in a CDB or other platform, but figure out how to do it even in an offline way. And then I would say keep that, that constant mentality of what I also mentioned earlier around staying nimble you know, with whatever data you do have. You know, put in a rigorous test and learn process. You know, constantly measure it, set goals, and try new things. There's ways to do that, and I think it's all about putting focus on that mm -hmm. and starting to enable that kind of information about your customers to inform your experience and the rest of your business. That makes total sense, and that's great yeah. advice. Um, so let's talk about some industry stuff. Mm -hmm. So the retail landscape, it's changed pretty dramatically over the last couple of years. What are the changes that you've noticed the most in terms of consumer behavior and purchase behavior? Yeah. I think I would start by saying overall, and you know, we've all heard it in the room, uh, you know, customers aren't as loyal to brands uh, as they used to be. I would say that there's just, there's so much access to information and other brands out there that you have to win on different things to stand out. A big one being experience, which I've been mentioned kind of throughout um, our conversation so far, and I think Again, coming back to understanding your customer and what's the best way to deliver that experience, you know, whether on a mobile uh, focus, you know, experience, as you all know, can mean everything from you know, an easy navigation path, you know, an amazing shoppable social port platform, you know, what's important to your customer all the way through you know, if you do have physical locations, you know, how do you bring those experiences that are going to mean something and draw your customers in, whether it's differentiated product um, or other services, you know, like Drybar does, and we work really hard to keep uh, that fresh and relevant as well. Um, I would say the last thing I'd add to it is, uh, to me it's interesting, particularly with some of the newer DTC brands, uh, we talked about earlier too, um, emerging, you know, how you see a lot of them, even though they started really digitally native, now going back into physical retail, which to me kind of singles that, that physical touch and feel and touch and experience of a brand isn't going anywhere. And if you can really nail that, I think that's what's going to, again, help you stand out and win. Yeah. So talked a lot about experience, and you just mentioned D2C brands. Why do you think a lot of these D2C startups like Glossier and like Goat today, and of course like Drybar, why do you think they're gaining such traction in the market? 
Yeah, uh, I think there's a few things. Uh, first, yeah, they are laser focused on their customer and data. And I believe all of those examples have tapped into particularly you know, the millennial Gen Z segments and you know, their preferences and behaviors, which I would say you know, from my experience, you know, they're, they're making their decisions more based on their emotions, they're willing to try new things, getting back to what I said earlier, less brand loyal and looking for those experiences. And those brand examples have done a great job of delivering that. You know, I also think it's interesting that several of those examples too, you know, are brands that literally have taken everyday necessities and made them cool through great design and great packaging and experience. And so that's where I think they will be able to continue to appeal to a broader set of consumers too, um, and particularly some of the older segments as well. Um, you know, I think the big challenge for all of them will be how do they retain customers and keep them long term before the next brand comes along. And so some of the things you see them doing, whether opening physical locations, expanding their experience, I think clearly are signaling some of those tactics to, to be focused on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you've worked for some legacy brands like J. Crew, right? Um, for those legacy brands that are trying to, you know, embody some of that startup mentality or trying to be more nimble, what advice would you give to them to start to keep up with uh, brands like you? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, if you look to a lot of the legacy retailers, they, again, have an amazing brand position. A lot of them, you know, iconic, particularly the examples of the ones I've worked for. They also have a great access to data, but far and away, they don't know how to use it, or because they've kind of come so far, it's very difficult to pivot and figure out how to do that. I think that is the number one thing I'd say to focus on. Uh, the second piece is, and coming from some of those brands myself, uh, and it's been a big a learning for me even since I've been at Dry Bar, you know, I think those legacy retailers do need to amplify the focus on experience too. You know, they, if you're buying a Chuck Taylor, you know, or a pair of J. Crew chinos, you know, it's a trusted brand and you will likely go back and buy those products and it's not as reliant on the, on the experience even though they focus on those things too. So I think as more brands again, you know, come into the landscape, uh, making sure that they are amping up their experience, again, circling it back to the data and using that, I think will you know, help them to continue their strong positions. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So internally too, I mean, you guys are growing, but there's always competition. How do you encourage your team to stay nimble? How do you encourage them to keep you know, accepting new things or thinking outside of the box, trying something new? Yeah, I'd say the big thing is, and since I've been at Dry Bar, uh, we've, we've built out and added a lot to our team across the company. Uh, so one of the things that's important to myself as well as the other executives at Dry Bar is, you know, we believe ideas truly can come from anywhere. And when I apply that to my team on the marketing side, you know, we have a constant new, I'd say it's a newer process around brainstorming ideas. And as I said earlier, always keeping a focus on testing and learning and being nimble and trying new things. We allocate a certain amount of our budget just so that we can do that on top of our uh, ongoing investments and things that fuel the business. And you know, even over the past year, we've seen some really great ideas come from different parts of the team. You know, a great digital idea might come from someone on the brand team and vice versa. And so we really try to foster that with you know, a lot of the folks that have been with Drybar since the beginning and then some of the newer people that have come into the brand. And it's been really amazing to see how, how those new insights and leveraging our data can bring those types of opportunities. That's great. So last question. Yep. In your time at Drybar overall, what's the, just the biggest lesson that you've learned? Yeah, so I think the biggest lesson uh, that I've learned is 
you know, as you scale and scale at a rate as rapidly as we are, uh, never lose your eye on consistency and quality. Like we know that and that our experience really is what drives our brand, keeps people coming in. Uh, but similar to some of the examples I said about some of the other footwear and apparel retailers I've worked at where we focused on experience but it didn't, it didn't really have as big of importance it really does at Dry Bar. So I'd say it's that coupled with how much of that really relates back to our people out in the field. Uh, so our stylists, our store teams, as well as our customers and building that community that makes Dry Bar amazing and Dry Bar great. Constantly, again, keeping a laser focus on that. And so with that, we're gonna be rolling out um, some really fun programs later this year focused on that and building out our community. Uh, which I hope you guys will keep an eye on uh, when we share that. Awesome. Well, these have all been amazing insights. It's been great to hear from you. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys.